Hello and welcome to our presentation on Transition from School to Adulthood for Foster Care Families. My name is Chesley Gertz and I'm the Advocacy Director at the ARC of Northwest Wayne County. Our chapter of the ARC provides information and advocacy to people with developmental disabilities so that they can participate fully in school and in the community. This presentation was made possible by a grant from Project Launch. Project Launch helps children and young adults with disabilities pursue meaningful careers, live as independently as possible, and enjoy inclusion at work and in the community. The focus of this webinar is on transition planning in school. By the end of the webinar, you should have an understanding of what school transi transition planning is and why it's important, what should happen during transition planning in school, options for life when school is done, and resources that you can use to make the most out of transition planning. There are many transitions throughout life, but the one I'm focusing on today is the transition from school to adulthood, with an emphasis on IEP requirements and the foster care experience. We know that all students need guidance in order to make the leap from high school to the next step. But for students with disabilities and those in foster care, this step is going to require more planning. We also know that the percentages of students with disabilities and in foster care who attend college is low, and the percentage of adults with disabilities who are employed is also low. Some of the ways we can change that is by having high expectations of these students while they're still in school, empowering them to make deci decisions, and by understanding how the transition planning process can be used to explore every possibility for post-secondary life. Thankfully, the law that governs special education requires and recognizes the need for transition planning. All schools are required to facilitate this process starting during the year a student turns 16. Transition planning can start earlier if the IEP team decides it's appropriate to do so. Transition plans become part of the IEP starting during the year the student will turn 16. The purpose of transition planning is to help the student hone their vision for life, to get everyone thinking about that vision, and to coordinate activities that will help them make that vision a reality. It should be totally focused on the student's strengths, preferences, and interests. And the process should be collaborative. That means that even though the school facilitates the process and handles the paperwork, students and their community of adults will be the ones actively involved in this process and working together to make it happen. The transition plan gets reviewed every year at the annual IEP, but in between meetings, there will be ongoing assessment of how things are going and there will be activities to do along the way. Before I go any further, I'm going to take a few moments to rewind a few years to middle school. Well before your student's IEP team starts the official transition planning process at age 16, the Michigan Merit Curriculum requires that all students in seventh grade with and without disabilities start an Educational Development Plan, or EDP. The purpose of the EDP is to help students explore career interests and develop action plans for reaching their goals. The EDP gets started in seventh grade and must be completed by eighth grade before students go to high school. Schools can use a variety of formats to develop EDPs, including web-based systems that introduce students to different career pathways, offering a class where the EDP will be developed, or meeting with a counselor one-on-one. -on -one. The purpose is to help students think about long-term education and career plans before entering high school. By going through this process, students learn more about themselves, explore different options for their future, and decide on what classes to take in high school. This really helps students make a connection between what they're doing in high school and what they want to do when school is done. Information from the EDP can and should be used to assist in transition planning. The EDP gets reviewed and updated every year, usually by the student counselor. I included a sample EDP in your list of handouts, which I'm not going to go over today, but if you get a few minutes, do take a look at it. 
I know sometimes it helps to actually see something to understand what it's all about. So by the end of eighth grade, your student has an educational development plan and is hopefully starting to think about life after school. The law that governs special education, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, requires that IEP teams take this planning a step further by requiring the transition planning process. Again, the EDP gets completed in eighth grade and transition planning in an IEP starts the year the student turns 16. IDEA has required that transition plans must include these four components, data from transition assessments, measurable post-secondary goals, services to reach those goals, and information about the transfer of rights when students turn 18. This ensures a process that is ongoing. The student and their community of adults gauge the student's interests and progress in school. Goals are developed with the student's vision in mind. A plan for services and activities gets put into place and then students are informed about their rights once they turn 18. I'm going to go through each one of the, these components in more detail over the next several slides, but first I want to show you what a blank transition plan might look like. This transition plan attachment is one that Wayne County Schools use. The form may have been updated a bit since I, since I obtained it, but the components on the form are going to be pretty much the same from county to county. You can see there is information at the top about the transfer of rights at the age of majority, which we'll get to later on in the presentation. Um, a bit lower, there's a space where you can include assessments that were used to gather information about the student. And then following that, their post-secondary goals. And the plan continues on a second page with information about post-secondary services. As I mentioned earlier, the transition planning process must be student focused. The student's interests, preferences, and strengths must be considered every step of the way. And who better to advocate for those things than the student? For many young people and adults, participating in IEP meetings can feel intimidating. So practice and preparation is key. There are many ways to prepare for and participate in an IEP meeting and in a transition plan meeting. Before an IEP meeting, teachers in the student's community of adults should talk to the student about their interests and their vision for life. Students can also prepare materials to share during the meeting. For example, I've been in meetings where students prepared PowerPoint presentations that they start, excuse me, that they show at the start of the meeting to set the agenda and the tone. Other students can show pictures depicting their strengths and interests. I'm reminded of one meeting where a student who doesn't communicate verbally put together a picture book where she pasted in pictures of herself doing activities that she enjoys and wanted to keep doing, like playing baseball, playing games with her family, cooking a meal, and things like that. Students can also activate a switch to begin a slide presentation. I've seen other students memorize a few key points that they wanted to share. And an instance where a teacher worked with a student to prepare some visual cues to help them communicate what they wanted to say. Students could be provided with choice cards to indicate what they agree or disagree with throughout the meeting that they can show um, whenever it's appropriate. They could also have visual representations of the meeting topics so that everyone can follow along. This could look like the word education or the word school being printed on a card with a picture of a school building on it, for example. That could be shown when it's time to talk about um, post-secondary education. During the meeting, students should be given the time, space, and encouragement to ask questions and give opinions rather than just listen. Students can also lead the meeting which could look like having the student introduce each section of the IEP and transition plan. They could be the one to decide when it's time to move on to the next section. They could introduce their IEP, IEP team members, or they can even give a summary review of their current performance level. 
Again, these things take preparation as students should not be put into situations they are unprepared for or feel uncomfortable with. A great way to help students get comfortable with IEP meetings is to have them attend even a portion of their IEP meeting starting in middle or elementary school so that they get comfortable with the process. Well before the meeting, talk with them to give them an age appropriate explanation of why this meeting is happening and why their voice is so important and give them some choices on how they'd like to participate. Try also to work with the teacher to decide when would be a good time for the student to attend the IEP meeting. Give students opportunities early on to make decisions concerning their education and encourage them to take the lead on age appropriate activities. If you get your student involved as a partner whose input is valuable to the process, you'll have a lot more success engaging the student. You'll be helping them to increase their confidence and teaching them life skills and you'll increase the chances that this whole transition planning process will be successful. At the same time, it's important to understand that trauma can often result in executive function deficits, like issues with organization, planning out and starting on tasks and problem solving. And so those deficits can create barriers to involvement in this process. You can help by working with teachers, therapists, social workers, and others to put some things in place to help compensate for those deficits, like breaking tasks down into basic, concrete, and measurable steps, using visuals like checklists to help a student understand what their role is or, or what activities they're going to be doing, and keep meetings short while also working with those same professionals to help students improve in those areas. Now I'm going to show you an example of a really simple tool that you can use to help your student prepare for their transition meeting. This worksheet is called a one pager and it was taken from a website called I'm Determined, which is included in the resource list for today's presentation. Students can complete this one pager with information about what they feel their strengths, interests, preferences, and needs are, and then share it at the IEP meeting. The Undetermined website has some nice resources for youth, educators, and families or caring adults, including this one pager and some other visual tools to help prepare for transition planning. Another note about the transition planning process in general is to try to get other caring ad adults involved in the process. If you're a school staff person, invite the caseworker, foster parent, biological parent, if appropriate, to the meeting, as well as a surrogate parent if one is involved. If you're the caseworker or foster parent, try to show up for the transition planning meetings if you can, because your support and involvement really can make a difference. And a quick note about surrogate parents. When necessary for some youth in foster care, a judge may have already appointed a surrogate parent to help make decisions on the student's behalf. But if there is no surrogate parent and no biological parent can be identified or located, the foster care caseworker or the school district itself can request the appointment of a surrogate parent. For more information about that, I've included the link to a guidance document on surrogate parents and special education in the list of handouts that Michigan Alliance for Families has provided. Now let's dive into those four required components of transition plans, the first of which is transition assessments. Transition assessments are really an ongoing process to gather information about the student's strengths, preferences, and interests as they relate to future living, learning, and working environments. This assessment process starts in middle school with that educational development plan and continues until the student exits school. The information that's gathered during transition assessments is then used to guide the transition planning and IEP process. Some people think of this step as answering the question, where are we now? What is the student interested in right now? What do they know about the careers or jobs they're interested in? And how are their work and study habits? Usually when we hear the word assessment, we think of something formal, like standardized tests. But transition assessments should include lots of things. Reviewing work samples to learn about academic strengths and most used accommodations. 
having conversations with students and caring adults to get a clear idea of their vision for the future or to help students figure out what their vision is. Observations of the student in work-related tasks to see, are they on task? Are they following directions? Are they getting along with others? And then interest inventories and questionnaires can be used to help students narrow down their interests, to learn about their past work-related experiences, and to get an idea of what the student feels are their strengths and the areas that they want to grow or improve in. And then finally, standardized assessments can also be a component of transition assessment to help gather information about the student's interests and skills. A couple that I often hear about are career cruising, which I believe is an online program, and the STAT-R, or Student Transition Assessment Tool, which I believe is administered on paper, but there are many tools out there. When you get to this portion of the meeting, if you hear information that doesn't make sense to you, or if you're hearing lots of scores that are being reported, you can and should ask for clarification or context. You can also ask what sorts of informal assessments were done. If you're going through the transition plan, but you're feeling like it's a bit lackluster, you can ask for different assessments and information gathering to be done, and then set a date by which you'll reconvene and look at an updated transition plan. These assessments really do inform the entire process, including developing goals. So once those assessments are done, the student's teacher will put together a draft transition plan as part of the annual IEP that gets reviewed and discussed during the IEP meeting. Hopefully the goal setting will have been done collaboratively with the student. As I said a few moments ago, the information gathered through assessments, conversations, and observations is used to develop these post-secondary goals. Post-secondary goals are the second required part of transition planning. These are long-term goals to be accomplished after exiting school. These goals will not be accomplished during school because the intent is to plan for the future when school is over. Post-secondary goals must be written in each of the four following areas, education, training, employment, and independent living if applicable. These are going to be long-term goals for living, working, and learning as an adult. The projected post-secondary goals in the student's IEP establish a direction for the student, school, and others to move toward. While assessments can be thought of, of answering the question, where are we now? Post-secondary goals help answer the question, where are we going? Again, having students participate in setting these goals really is key. They need to be invested in the goals because they pertain directly to them. Encourage your student to talk with you about their vision for the future and help them out by giving voice to that vision when you meet with the school. As I mentioned, the teacher will usually have already writ written a draft transition plan, including post-secondary goals by the time you get to the meeting. But know that what you see when you get to the meeting is a draft and can be changed based on what gets talked about during the meeting. Also keep in mind that these post-secondary goals will probably change several times as the, as the child's interests develop through the years, and that's exactly what you want. The process of transition planning gives time for exploration and maturity so that the student's goals can start off broad and get more specific as they grow. Post-secondary goals are reviewed and updated every year, along with the rest of the IEP. Here are a few examples of items that could be included as post-secondary goals. Remember, post-secondary goals have to be written in the areas of education, training, employment, and independent living, if applicable. As you can imagine, education and training have a lot of overlap. Some examples of education and training goals are to attend a four-year college for business management, participate in on-the-job training at Detroit Metro Airport, or participate in a skill-building program to focus on time management. Some examples for employment post-secondary goals could be to work part-time at a pet store while attending a two-year college, 
and then after graduating, work full-time as a vet tech, or to work at a local hospital with a job coach. Uh, an example of independent living goals could be to live independently in an apartment, schedule appointments, pay bills, and access services in the community by using the city bus. Or a goal could be to prepare for each day by dressing and feeding oneself with assistance. When developing post-secondary goals for students in foster care, include some goals around developing lifelong connections with a community of supportive adults and connecting with foster care self-advocacy groups. Youth in foster care have said that finding mentors is so important, it can be very difficult. So making that part of a student's school transition plan is a great way to take time to help them establish those connections and relationships. As you get into this process and start setting goals with the school, you'll definitely want to consider any goals that are being worked on by the foster care caseworker. As a teen approaches age 18, their caseworker is going to be doing a lot of work with them around transitioning from foster care. Invite the caseworker to these meetings and include them in these conversations. It will be helpful to understand what they are discussing with the youth in regard to the transition to adulthood. Both sets of transition plans, school and foster care, can be more robust if there is overlap between the two. You also don't want to create too much redundancy between the two plans where there are people working on exactly the same things. This brings us now to the course of study. In Michigan, there are two options for high school. That is exiting school with a diploma and exiting school without a diploma. The first option is what many consider a traditional course of study, which is exiting high school with a diploma. This involves meeting state standards called the Michigan Merit Curriculum, as well as any graduation requirements set by the student's local high school. In this case, school services end when the diploma is issued. Some of you may have heard the term personal curriculum before. Personal curriculum is a tool that can be used to modify the rigor of the Michigan Merit Curriculum. If the IEP team determines that a student's disability is the reason they are not able to access or demonstrate proficiency in some of the required content, like Algebra 2 or a foreign language, for example, then a personal curriculum can be developed for that specific content area. A personal curriculum is not a special education provision specifically, but students with IEPs are eligible for this conversation. Their counselor is usually going to be the point person on personal curriculum. So if you want to bring this up at a meeting, be sure to have the counselor invited. There is a resource included in your list of handouts where you can learn more about personal curriculum. And lastly, career and technical education can also be incorporated as a student works toward their diploma. I've heard that sometimes students in foster care can have difficulties earning credits because of moves between schools, and especially when those schools have different graduation requirements. What you can do to help with this is connect with your student's counselor for help sorting out graduation requirements. And if needed, Connect with the district's foster care liaison for help. Every school district has a foster care liaison that is supposed to help with these sorts of things. You can find that person by contacting your district's board office and asking for the foster care liaison. Another resource could be an education planner, which I'm going to talk about in just a few slides. The second option for course of study is to exit high school without a diploma. This is widely referred to for students with IEPs as getting a certificate of completion. Different from exiting with a diploma, there is no established statewide curriculum and no specific requirements for getting a certificate of completion. Instead, the students' post-secondary goals would drive their class selections and everything else. Students with IEPs who do not earn a diploma are eligible for school services in Michigan through age 26. Sometimes these services will be provided in a program for students over 18 that is run by the school district. And sometimes those programs have curriculums they use, which are aimed at students of transition age. Career and technical education can also be a part of the student's course of study, 
even if they are not earning a diploma. To decide which course of study is going to be the best option, you want to have conversations with the student, the school, and their community of adults and talk about things like accommodations that could help the student earn credit. Talk about the possibility of using the personal curriculum and talk about career and technical education so that you make sure you're covering all of your options before a decision is made. All right, transition services are the third required component of transition planning. Transition services are really a set of activities which help move the student toward achieving their post-secondary goals. It's important to know that many of the transition services and activities stated in your student's transition plan are going to take place outside of school, at home and in the community. Transition services need to be identified under the same four core areas that post-secondary goals address, employment, education, training, and independent living if applicable. These services and activities must be based on the student's needs and goals, again, accounting for their strengths, preferences, and interests. Transition services should include the activities that the student and their community of adults will complete. The community of adults can include the special and general education teachers, related school service providers, counselors, other school personnel, outside agencies, foster parents, family members, community members, and others. Here are some examples of transition services under each of those four core areas. Tra uh, for training, some examples would be study skills training, social skills training, or practice requesting accommodations. Under education, Transition services could include instruction and modeling and how to advocate for oneself in class, could include getting some direct instruction in math or taking a college tour. For employment, some transition services could include learning to read and follow a daily visual schedule, getting some community work experience, or getting a referral to vocational rehabilitation, which I'll talk about on the next slide. And then some independent living transition service examples could be learning to master the use of adaptive switches for kitchen appliances to prepare meals, memorizing their phone number, or getting some direct instruction in practical math skills like money, using money and making change. By the time the transition plan portion of the IEP wraps up, you and your student should have a clear understanding of what activities everyone is going to attempt or accomplish by a certain time. If there are activities that you're having a hard time getting done for any reason, ask for the IEP team to reconvene and make a plan for helping you out. It's ideal for the student, their foster parent, their caseworker, and the school to really work together and collaborate on getting these things done. If you need help or if you have questions, reach out to the teacher and let them know. If you feel like your IEP team needs some support with transition planning, reach out to your district special education administrator. And this isn't to get anyone in trouble, but instead, many times that person can offer support to you and to the school team with creative thinking on how to plan and get things done. And oftentimes that special education administrator has knowledge of available resources throughout their district. I've included a document in your list of handouts for this presentation that gives some great examples of transition services to help get you thinking about your student. Okay, so Michigan Rehabilitation Services, or MRS, is part of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. This organization provides employment and education-related services and training to help teens and adults with disabilities find and keep employment. As I mentioned on the last slide in the example, a referral to Michigan Rehabilitation Services could be a good transition service or activity to engage in. I've given Michigan Rehabilitation Services its own slide because they can be a great resource for college and career planning and connecting with this organization would be a good transition service to include in the plan. Some things that Michigan Rehabilitation Services can help students with are exploring their interests and talents, 
and seeing how those things could lead to a job, learning about different jobs, figuring out their career goals, helping with assistive technology and accommodations on a job, learning how to request accommodations on a job, and help actually getting and maintaining employment. Michigan Rehabilitation Services also has a program targeted to younger students ages 14 and up called Pre-Employment Transition Services, or Pre-X for short. Through the Pre-X program, MRS can help students learn about different jobs, consider which jobs interest them, and learn what employment type skills they need to gain or improve on to be successful. The Pre-X program can also provide work-based learning um, experiences for students. They can provide counseling for students on options for continued education and training after high school and a lot of other things. Something to be aware of is that consent is required for the pre-ex program since students in this program would be under 18. You can talk with your student's caseworker for help understanding who the appropriate person would be to give consent for this program. And then to connect with Michigan Rehabilitation Services, you can either ask the school to invite someone from the organization to the IEP meeting, or you can find your local office and connect with them yourself. Next, I've included a list of other programs and resources specific to students in foster care that are worth exploring as you talk about transition services with the school. Since I am not a foster care specialist, I'm going to give you a brief overview of each one of these resources and then encourage you to visit the websites and talk with your student's foster care caseworker to learn more. Links to all of these resources are included in your list of handouts for today. First on our list is education planners. Education planners are typically for youth ages 14 to 21, and they have a few roles. They can provide direct assistance to youth in foster care, act as a liaison between the child welfare and education systems, help with school enrollment and transferring records, provide guidance on special education matters, and more. They might also be a good resource for when you're trying to figure out who is responsible for signing special education documents. The link to this resource in your list of handouts includes the names and contact information for all education planners in the state. Unfortunately, there is not an education planner in every county, but for the counties who do not have one, there are Department of Health and Human Services points of contact that can fill this role. I included a link to those points of contact in your resource list as well. To get connected with an education planner, talk with your student's caseworker and ask them to make a referral, or you can contact the education planner or point of contact directly. Next, the Young Adult Voluntary Foster Care Program, or YAVFC. This is a way to extend foster care to age 21. Young adults in this program can benefit by having an extension of their foster care payments, caseworker support, counseling services, health care coverage, and more time to learn independent living skills. Foster parents or foster youth can ask their caseworker to apply for this program, or you can contact your local Department of Health and Human Services office and ask for the Young Adult Voluntary Foster Care Liaison. Next, the Education and Training Voucher Program provides funds to meet the education and training needs of youth aging out of foster care. This program provides vouchers of, of up to $5,000 a year to eligible youth attending college and vocational programs up to age 26. Vouchers can be used toward the cost of tuition, books, room and board, a computer, and other items pertaining to education and training. Directions for applying for these vouchers can be found at the link in the list of handouts. Next, Youth in Transition Program funds can be used to assist with purchasing goods and services to help youth in foster care become self-sufficient. Youth in Transition funds can be used for many, many things, including, but not limited to, tutoring, cap and gown, prom dress or tux, um, ACT or SAT fees, paying for the GED exam, paying for driver's training classes, bus cards, getting a uniform for a job, um, car insurance, repairs, and a lot more. 
These funds can be available through age 22. To access the funds, you have to talk to your foster care caseworker. And then for a list of everything the funds can cover, there is a link to the Youth in Transition Training, or excuse me, the Youth in, Tran the Youth in Transition section in the Foster Care Manual in your list of handouts. Next, the Michigan Youth Opportunities Initiative focuses on youth in foster care from ages 14 to 21 and targets housing, education, employment, community engagement, and health. I believe there are Michigan Youth Opportunities Initiative sites in every county in Michigan. Some of the services they offer include life skills and money management training, business development workshops, opportunities for internship, and funds available for tuition, books, computers, software, and campus housing, and more. Individuals can also learn stipends for participating in the Michigan Youth Opportunities Initiative by attending events and going to meetings. I included a link to this website as well as to a link to all of the Michigan Youth Opportunities Initiative coordinators in your list of handouts for this presentation. And then the last item here is Supportive Adult, which is not a program but rather is an opportunity for someone who is not a licensed foster parent to take on a mentorship role for a teen in foster care, which could look like offering career guidance, helping with preparation for college or trade school, navigating relationships and other things. I included this here because a colleague of mine who is a licensed foster parent was looking for a way to connect with a teen in foster care without actually having them live in her home. She agreed to take on a mentorship role for the teen and is considered a supportive adult to her now. It's important to know that a person does not have to be a licensed foster parent to have this role, just a willingness to be a long-term mentor. You can talk to your caseworker to learn more about this. So far, we've gone over three of the four components of transition planning, transition assessments, post-secondary goals, including the course of study, and transition services, including connecting with programs, resources, and community service providers. These components fit together in one cohesive transition plan. The transition plan then becomes part of the IEP, and IEP goals should be developed that support the transition plan. The educational development plan is still in play and doesn't go away when transition planning begins. Information from that educational development plan should be considered when creating the transition plan, which then informs the development of the IEP. If your student is not exiting school with a diploma and will be continuing with education services through age 26, the transition planning process continues throughout that time as well and is reviewed at every annual IEP. There is a fourth required component of transition plans, which involves talking with the student about the rights they have when they turn 18. And I'll get to that in just a couple slides. But before we move on, I want to talk for just a minute about bringing the school transition plan and the foster care transition plan together. So we've gone over the majority of what's included in the school's transition planning process. But for youth in foster care, there is also going to be transition planning done through the foster care system. I see the purpose of both as planning and preparing for life as an adult. In schools, planning starts at age 16 and is facilitated by the school. In schools, the focus is on the transition to work or post-secondary education and training and involves completing activities that will help the student prepare for education, employment, and independent living. And then in foster care, the focus is on the transition to independent living, including housing, education, employment, health insurance, mentoring, and support services. There is overlap in, this, in these transition plans, and that's why it's important to collaborate to the greatest extent possible. When everyone involved with the youth in foster care communicates and works together, a lot more will get done a lot more efficiently. Sharing relevant information between the foster care system and the school system is allowable and encouraged. 
Sharing information between these systems will inform each transition plan and help achieve consistency between the plans. It would be ideal to review both plans at the IEP transition plan meeting to strengthen the activities and to make sure you're not repeating tasks or doubling up on things accidentally. Adults should also communicate between meetings to strengthen the coordination of activities, services, and plans. Sometimes that looks like including multiple people on an email or on a conference call. And then we talked about education planners earlier. Find your foster care education planner and find out who your contact is for special education services within the school district and work together to make sure everyone is staying student focused. These two systems operate independently, but the student is at the center of both systems. The final required component of transition planning in school is including information about what's called the transfer of rights at the age of majority. On or before a student's 17th birthday, schools have to tell students that when they turn 18, they are an adult and have certain rights. While their parents or other adults were in charge of making decisions before, turning 18 means that other adults do not automatically have that authority anymore. All students, regardless of their level of disability, have to be informed of this transfer of rights, and information should be delivered in a way the student can understand. I wanted to highlight here a few rights that transfer to students when they turn 18. Students 18 and over have the right to attend their own IEP meeting. They have the right to give permission for testing and evaluations. And on the flip side of that, they have the right to withhold permission for testing and evaluations. When students are 18, they have the right to approve changes to their IEP or to not approve changes to their IEP. They have the right to access their school records, and then they have the right to disagree with the IEP team and to get information about how to solve any disputes they might have with their IEP. It's also appropriate around this age for students to get information about their rights when it comes to getting help with decision making. Oftentimes people think that when a person with a disability turns 18, that it's necessary to appoint a guardian to make decisions for them but that is not always true. Every person can make choices and indicate their preferences in some way and have the right to make decisions about their life no matter what their disability is. Guardianship involves taking those rights away from the individual and giving them to someone else. So I want to share some other options for consideration. Before a student in foster care turns 18, the foster care caseworker will share information with them about selecting a health care power of attorney or a health care proxy. So in other words, appointing someone to help them make mental, excuse me, help them make health care decisions or to make health care decisions if they are not able to do so. It's important to know that people with developmental disabilities can also appoint a power of attorney, no matter the type of their disability. They do not need to pass a competency exam or anything like that in order to appoint a power of attorney. While in foster care, if the youth decides to establish a durable power of attorney for health care, their caseworker will help them get the right forms and talk to them about the steps needed to establish that power of attorney. I've listed some other alternatives to guardianship here, including supported decision-making agreements, which are an informal way of documenting who the individual would like to help them make decisions. And by informal, I mean that supported decision-making agreements are not legal documents here in Michigan, but rather are a way for everyone in the individual's life to understand their role in helping them make decisions. Another option to consider is power of attorney, which on the other hand is a legal document where the individual themselves designates someone to help them make decisions about their finances, school, service providers, and other things. With power of attorney, the individual still has the right to make decisions, but this document allows for someone they've identified to help them make those decisions. And then another option for decision-making is representative payee. This option only applies to social security benefits. 
The person who is appointed representative payee is allowed to help the individual manage their SSI or social security funds. So how can we use the school transition planning process to prepare students for making their own decisions as adults and prepare them for that transfer of rights? It is crucial for students with disabilities and youth in foster care to be directly involved in meetings, conversations, and transition activities so they can develop decision-making and self-determination skills. Self-determination simply means gaining control over your own life. Learning to set your own goals, being involved in making decisions about your life, and advocating for yourself are skills that will serve students for all of their adult lives. During the transition planning process, include students in conversations and meetings. Look for opportunities where the student can learn and practice these skills. Encourage the student to get involved with disability and um, foster care, foster care self-advocacy groups so that they can see how other people in their communities advocate for themselves. Consider including the development of self-determination skills and connecting with self-advocacy groups as school transition goals and activities. In post-secondary education, like college and trade school, there is no requirement to find students with disabilities and put accommodations in place on their behalf. Students will only get accommodations and services when they self-identify as a per person with a disability and ask for accommodations and then advocate for receiving those accommodations. Similarly, when it comes to services for adults with disabilities in the community, people have to seek out those services on their own. At work, the discussion of mutually agreed upon workplace accommodations starts only when an employee discloses their disability and asks for accommodations. When it comes to youth in foster care with disabilities, it's really important to build these self-determination skills throughout their school experience so they feel confident advocating for themselves as adults. Something that comes up at many school transition planning meetings I've attended is a conversation about applying for public benefits, including SSI and Medicaid. SSI, or Supplemental Security Income, is a needs-based program that individuals with disabilities may be eligible for. SSI takes into consideration a person's income and assets first, and then their disability status when determining eligibility. However, for youth transitioning from foster care, there is no income or asset test to qualify for SSI and Medicaid. Their foster care, foster care status is enough to qualify them. For youth who are still in foster care, caseworkers are responsible for identifying those who are potentially eligible for SSI and then initiating the application on their behalf. If a person is under 18 when they become eligible for SSI, that eligibility gets redetermined at age 18. For youth who age out of foster care at ages 18, 19, or 20, they are automatically eligible for a Medicaid program called Foster Care Transitional Medicaid. Again, there is no income or asset test for a Foster Care Transitional Medicaid because their foster care status is enough to qualify them. Former foster care youth who were in foster care at age 18 and now their case is closed are still eligible for Medicaid until age 18, excuse me, until age 26 without having to meet the income and asset limits. And for youth participating in the Young Adult Voluntary Foster Care Program that we talked about a few slides ago, Medicaid stays in place while they are in the program. Be aware that if a person is eligible for SSI, they will automatically be eligible for Medicaid. The eligibility criteria are the same for both programs. Medicaid is important not only for healthcare, but also because most of the services available for adults with developmental disabilities are paid for by Medicaid. Let's talk about those services next. As you're going through the school transition planning process, and talking about what types of support the youth may need as an adult, you should know that for adults with developmental disabilities, the services they need will most likely be paid for by Medicaid and provided through something called the Community Mental Health System. 
a person has to have Medicaid in order to access these services. Community mental health services are administered by each county in Michigan and are offered to people who have intellectual and developmental disabilities, substance use disorders, and mental illnesses who also have Medicaid. Services available through the community mental health system can include supports coordination, which involves a person like a case manager who helps people access whatever assistance is needed to live a quality life, including the other things you see here. Services can also include paid staff, which is probably one of the biggest things that Medicaid and community mental health provide. And that means hiring someone to provide whatever assistance is needed to help a person with a disability increase or maintain their personal self-sufficiency, participate in the community, and be as productive and independent as possible. Some other services available through the community mental health system for adults with developmental disabilities include transportation, skill building programs and supported employment, which I'll talk about in a moment, and peer supports, who are people with disabilities that can provide mentorship and guidance to their peers as they navigate these services. To find your local community mental health service provider and enroll, you will need to go to michigan.gov slash mdhhs, scroll down to behavioral health and developmental disability, click on mental health, and then click on community mental health services to go to the map of programs and find the program in your county. Um, another more straightforward way would be to contact the Community Mental Health Association of Michigan. And I have the link right there in the box on the right of your screen. Or you can just Google, Google the name of your county along with the phrase Community Mental Health and your local agency should appear in the search. I don't believe this is something that foster care workers help with, but I'm not certain. Um, if a person needs help understanding how to access these services, you can reach out to your local chapter of the ARC for help. During your school transition plan meetings, it's good to know that some, what some options are for life after school for adults with developmental disabilities. I'm going to give you a brief overview of each one of these options on the next slide. The first option is paid employment. If you've ever tried to find a job, you know that it helps to know your community and be resourceful. If you're still in the midst of transition planning in school, the IEP team can talk together about ideas for finding community employment. We also talked about MRS earlier, Michigan Rehabilitation Services. MRS can help not only with developing employment skills, but they can also help with finding paid employment. They often work with businesses in the community to develop talent and they can match employees to jobs. Next, supported employment is a model of employment that provides people with disabilities the support they need to succeed in a competitive work environment. Support on the job can be provided continuously, only as needed, or can start off strong and then diminish over time. It can also look like job development, which means helping to develop a job specifically for someone with a specific skill set. Supported employment can also include job coaching. A job coach is someone to be at your job with you to help you learn the job or help with tasks that you need assistance with. Supported employment is something that takes place in the community at a paying job. And oftentimes these programs can provide transportation for a person to and from work. Next are skill building programs, sometimes called day programs. Both supported employment and skill building programs are available through the community mental health system and are paid for by Medicaid. Skill building programs are focused on skill development rather than immediate employment, like working on timely attendance, following directions, completing tasks, staying safe on the job, and then problem solving, for example. Other ways to fill your time after exiting school include participating in the community, learning to socialize and build relationships, volunteerism, taking part in recreational activities. The paid staff I talked about earlier that comes through the community mental health system can be used to facilitate these activities 
and to help ensure a person's health and safety while they're doing them. Many people actually do a combination of these four items. The most important thing I want you to remember from this slide is that there are options and choices for life after school, no matter what a person's disability is or what type of assistance they need. And the biggest takeaway from this presentation is that transition planning in school is designed to provide opportunities for conversation and support during school so that the student will have a plan for life after school and the assistance necessary to achieve their goals. The work that gets done during transition planning will only help make things smoother as a person goes into adulthood. Benefits like SSI and Medicaid help pay for a quality life and community mental health services are available to provide the assistance needed to live that life. Do whatever you can to help your student imagine a vision for their life. Set high expectations and give them opportunities for leadership and control throughout the transition planning process, no matter what their disability is. Take their vision and build the transition plan with it in mind from the ground up, always keeping an eye on the end goal. Now that we've reached the end of the presentation, I wanna talk about a few resources that I've included on this slide. An entire list of the resources I shared throughout this presentation is available on the Michigan Alliance for Families website. Some of these I didn't touch on, but I included them on my list because they're great resources. Of course, the Michigan Alliance for Families website is a great place to find not only information specific to youth in foster care, but also tons of information about the entire special education process. I'm Determined is the website I mentioned earlier with the one-pagers and other resources for pre preparing for transition planning. Think College is a national organization that works toward improving inclusive higher education options for people with intellectual disabilities. They have some really nice resources there for college planning. Next, the PACER Center operates out of Minnesota, but has some great transition related information and resources on their website that are usable anywhere and really worth checking out. And lastly, the Family Matters webpage includes a ton of really easy to understand fact sheets that explain special education laws and practices. This concludes our presentation for today. I've included my contact information here in case anyone has questions about anything you've heard in this presentation or anything else. Thank you so much for participating and good luck on your journey.